Alrighty, here we go. Hey there, Digital World. Welcome back once again to another episode of Spliced In Later. Episode coming a bit earlier than normal during the week because I was able to see this movie earlier than anticipated. And why wait? Let's talk about it now. Then I can take a break before the big Barbie Oppenheimer face-off of 2023 next week. Today we are reviewing most likely my most anticipated movie of the year, if not the, definitely one of it's Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, Part 1. That's the vibe for 2023, apparently, is Part 1 movies. We had Fast 10, which is going to lead into Fast 10 Part 2. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, which is going to lead into Beyond the Spider-Verse. And now we have Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, Part 1 of 2. I was so anticipating this one because... Mission Impossible Fallout is probably one of my most favorite movies of all time. If it hadn't been for Avengers Infinity War coming out that year, it easily could have taken my top favorite film of 2018. The Mission Impossible franchise starring Tom Cruise and friends, it's it's kind of like the Fast and Furious in terms of a renaissance that it sort of had. The first film came out in 1996, relatively successful based on the old TV show of the same name some controversial changes to the character Jim Phelps from that one, but basically we cast him aside to focus on Tom Cruise's Ethan Hunt, a young super spy who is uh, caught in an incident where his entire team is killed, believed to be the perpetrator by his IMF cohorts. If you don't know what IMF stands for, it's Impossible Mission Force. So he has to get a, a, little, a little group together while on the run from his, his government to track down what really happened and save the world. Relatively successful, good 90s action film, not big. Uh, and then it gets a couple of sequels, Mission Impossible 2 in the early 2000s and Mission Impossible 3 in the late 2000s. Uh, depending on what you want out of a Mission Impossible film, depending on what your favorite style of action movie is, if you if you prefer a movie by John Woo or by J.J. Abrams, the, the vibe is very different across these three films. Uh, and it was, it, was, it was not kicking goals. It was doing all right, but it wasn't like... Mission Impossible is one of the biggest franchises of all time. Especially with a rotating cast, Tom Cruise is really the only mainstay through those early films, with the exception of lovable Ving Rhames as Luther Stickle. He's like one guy who remains in every team that Tom Cruise leads in each film. But then we get to 2011. We get Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, directed by Brad Bird. And much like Fast and Furious 2009, but mainly Fast Five, uh, Mission Impossible had a bit of a renaissance with Ghost Protocol. Uh, the vibe of the film, the way it was directed, the, the establishing of the team, the characters, the stakes, and of course the big draw, Tom Cruise legitimately doing big stunts in the films that he's doing. When he's climbing up that giant building in, in, in wherever it is, New Delhi, no, probably not. You know the one, it's the giant big building that he's climbing on the side of. Tom Cruise is actually doing that. But not only are the stunts really good, the choreograph of the action and the actual story that's going along is genuinely gripping and engaging. Everybody knows the theme music to Mission Impossible, which is like this tense counting down of a fuse music uh, where it's going to explode at any second. You've only got a matter of time to stop it and, and the clock's racing against you. That pretty much was Ghost Protocol. And from that point, the franchise is just built on that. It's got a core group of characters, Ethan Hunt and his team. He doesn't change out his team in every movie. You've got Ving Rhames, you've got Simon Pegg, Rebecca Ferguson, Jeremy Renner, a solid group that goes from movie to movie. Consequences in movies that happen in Ghost Protocol reflect into Rogue Nation and then into Fallout. The stunts get bigger. Tom Cruise is hanging out the side of a plane as it takes off or he's, he's jumping out of a plane uh, at a certain point high enough where he has to wear oxygen and he's actually doing that while acting that he has to save Henry Cavill who's knocked himself out so he's just flailing uh, to hanging on to the bottom of a helicopter while fighting with somebody else really impressive stuff and in an age where these days if it's action it's in front of a CG screen I mean we're just coming off Dial of Destiny with 80 year old Harrison Ford CGI to look like 40 year old Harrison Ford on a CGI train with a CGI background pretending to go after a CGI time traveling dial or whatever and it, it does feel a bit cold and stale but with these Mission Impossible films regardless of whether you think the story is good or not you cannot deny much in the way that Top Gun Maverick was appealing to people 
what you are watching is real. It looks real. It feels real. So you have an appreciation for it. It wraps you into the film and engages you in a way that a bunch of people standing in front of a CG screen can't necessarily do the same. So yeah, Ghost Protocol leads into Rogue Nation, then leads into Fallout, often regarded as the best in the Mission Impossible franchise, one of the best action films of all time. Uh, and here we are, we're into Dead Reckoning. Now, Dead Reckoning is billed as a part one movie. It absolutely is. Uh, the way the movie ends here, it's like end part one. And it's supposed to be the final send off for Tom Cruise as Ethan Hunt in these films. I don't know if Mission Impossible will continue on after that. I don't know if there's much in appeal, as an appeal for this franchise. Whether you love or hate Tom Cruise, you can't deny that he is the draw for these films. It's his character, his action, his his drive and motivation, and everything that's been going on in the Mission Impossible films. It is the Tom Cruise show. I don't know if taking him out and then trying to keep doing it without him will have the same success, but you never know. In the very least, it's building to a finale of sorts to this era of the Mission Impossible franchise. And I will say that even though it's uh, it's uh, the vibe of this year is to do part one films, I like that this one does that, but in a more self-contained way. It doesn't do a fast 10 thing where the action's kicking off and then somebody just decided, okay, that's it. No more movie. Come back in two years and we'll restart the movie when you're ready. Uh, and Across the Spider-Verse, even though it is my favorite film of the year so far, it also keeps building and building and building and building, drops a massive twist and then stops dead reckoning on the other hand the storyline is when it gets to the end it's still building to something and things aren't resolved but the thing that they need to do in this film is finished which is good and they can then build on to part two i was worried a lot at the end of the film when tom cruise is is hanging off trains on the edge of bridge cliffs and he's trying to hold on to a friend and his fingers are slipping I thought for sure it was going to cut to black and the credits were going to start because that's just the vibe of part one movies this year. But no, he finishes the mission that he needs to do. He's in a certain situation, whether he's in a good place or a bad place, you will have to watch the movie to find out. There's a voiceover wrapping up what you've seen beforehand and what is coming next. Uh, points you in the direction, you know where things are going and you're excited to see where it is, but you can comfortably go, cool, that's the end of that movie. In the future, you could easily put Dead Reckoning part one on with no intention of watching part two. It would be a silly thing to do, but you could satisfyingly do so. Do I like this movie? Uh, I don't know if you can tell from the positives I've been going on, but yes, I really, really, really liked Dead Reckoning part one. It's not my favorite Mission Impossible film. Uh, it had a lot going against it to beat Fallout. And I do think there are a couple of other Mission Impossible films that are probably better than this one. But in terms of the film as its own, as a part one film, as the final chapter for Ethan Hunt's story, I think we're off to a good start. You do have to put a couple of pins in that assumption though, because as it is a part one film, the story is not necessarily finished. And it's hard to review these part one films because you're missing the second half of the story. Part two may come out and unfold in such a way that it elevates this film even higher than what it is, or completely tanks it and takes it down a peg so you can't go like oh yeah this is the best mission impossible movie or this is the worst mission impossible movie because you do need that extra bit of information to know for certain but it definitely sits up there in the renaissance of mission impossible uh it's up to the standards of the others the action's fantastic the characters are fantastic the storyline is interesting and engaging and goes in a direction that I really did not expect. I, I don't know what I thought was going to be the plot of this film, but it wasn't really what it ended up being. And that's for the better. Uh, to give you a vague idea of what the plot is, because again, I don't like to spoil things for anybody. Uh, if you have any intention of seeing this movie, um, I would advise not reading any reviews or listening to anything about what anyone has to say about any movie ever. Always go and watch the movie you want to see if you're keen to see it, and then listen to what people had to say afterwards. Don't allow people's opinions to influence how you're going to perceive it. Allow yourself to be, uh, receive the film for better or worse and then find out what everybody else thought. Unless you are you really don't care, you're not going to see the movie and you just like hearing what people have to say, good or bad. Uh, but I'm not going to be that guy that's like, here's beat for beat everything that happens in the movie. 
Some minor, minor plot spoilers though, just in case. But basically, Dead Reckoning Part 1 is unique in that Ethan Hunt in this film is not necessarily going up against one specific bad guy out for world domination. He's up against several different interested parties that are all after a sentient, powerful AI called The Entity. Uh, the movie sort of starts off and you get the sense that The Entity has evolved to a point where yeah, it is self-aware and is actively working against humans. Uh, and then there's one character in here, the villain, played by Issa Morales. He's called Gabriel, uh, who basically sees himself as the merchant of death and believes that working with the Entity will allow him to just sow chaos and destruction across the world because that's what he wants to do. He has a past with Ethan that we've never seen before. It happened before Mission Impossible, before he joined the IMF. Uh, he's killed people in his past. He's done some terrible things. So they've got a score to settle with each other. But apart from him and his nefariousness, you also have a bunch of different interested parties, whether they're uh, criminal empire, warmongers, or the American government itself that want the entity and its self-awareness to use for their own purposes. In the middle of all of it is Ethan Hunt, who realizes immediately that a self-sufficient, self-aware AI who has already actively killed human beings is not good for anyone to have, no one should have it. So he immediately goes rogue from the IMF, from everybody who he is normally employed by, with his ultimate goal to find this thing and destroy it. To find this thing, he has to find a key. A key that has been split up in two parts and has been passed off to different parties. One particular half of the key is currently in the hands of a grifter, a thief, a rogue, played by Hayley Atwell. She plays Grace. Uh, they immediately get forced together with this key. Uh, he's trying to get it off her. She is very much not a team player. It's all about how she can make money off this thing and 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 sell it to the highest bidder or do. She doesn't really understand what she's got, but she's not like, oh, it's it's a key for an AI that's going to destroy the world. Yeah, all right, here it is. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, cool. This could make me some money. See you later. They get thrown together very reluctantly in a lot of situations while being hunted by the IMF, being hunted by Gabriel's forces, and being hunted by uh, criminal underlings that also have nefarious purposes for a self-sufficient AI. Uh, along for the ride, of course, are Tom Cruise's most loyal companions, Luther, played by Ving Rhames, Benji, played by Simon Pegg, and Ilsa, played by Rebecca Ferguson, a very solid team that have been with him for quite a few movies and have a very strong bond. They're all about friendship. They have each other's back. All they have is each other, essentially. However, the AI is aware of this and wants to destroy Ethan, so knows that to do that means to target his friends specifically, meaning blood will spill, people will die, and there's not much he can do about that. Shenanigans ensue, but basically we will get to a point where the key will be recovered by someone in particular, people will die, explosions will happen, Tom Cruise will jump off a cliff, a train will crash spectacularly, friends will die, characters that we've loved for the last couple of movies will be murdered horribly, uh, alliances will be broken, betrayals will be made, uh, leaving you going, oh my god, how are they going to stop the entity? How are they going to stop Gabriel? Uh, doesn't matter. Watch part two and you'll find out for certain. It's unique in that sense in that as much as I've talked about Gabriel as the villain, he really is, he's not really developed that much. Uh, I believe they're saving it for part two. The real scariness of the situation is that the entity is thinking 12 steps ahead of everybody else and always seems to know exactly what every outcome to every possible scenario is. So manipulates things in a way that benefits it and hampers Ethan. And that is unique in that Ethan has never gone up against something like that. Uh, and it's terrifying. And it's terrifying for everybody concerned easily, which makes for a very engaging, exciting film. What I really loved about the film was, of course, Tom Cruise and Friends. That's what I've liked about the other Mission Impossible films, because I like this core group of characters. Ethan, Luther, Benji, and Ilsa going on a mission together uh, putting on their masks, infiltrating things, working together, their banter, their real love and concern for one another is great. 
Uh, every movie, every time Simon Pegg's character has been in any sort of mortal danger, I've been so upset and worried because I love that character and this film is no exception. A highlight though for the film though is Hayley Atwell as Grace, the, the rogue, the ragamuffin, the scallywag that gets in Ethan's way a lot in this film. Uh, I realized watching it that I've never seen a movie with Hayley Atwell that's not set in a period piece. Like she's either Captain America's girlfriend or she's Christopher Robin's wife. So it was unique to see her in a present day setting, but I thought she absolutely killed it. She had great chemistry with Tom Cruise. They had really good banter. The whole point of the movie, I think, is her character arc and her journey to a maybe, maybe not become a better person or to give in to more scrupulous temptations. But the way she sells it and the way she is at the forefront are pretty much nearly big each big action set piece. She's almost as big an action star in here as Tom Cruise. And I really dug her story and her character. I thought she had really good comedic banter with Tom Cruise. I will say as well, this Mission Impossible is probably funnier than more of the others, but not in a forced way, not in like, a, oh, we have to do a Marvel thing where we have to be like Guardians of the Galaxies. The humor is very natural. For instance, there is a scene where Tom Cruise and Hayley Atwell have been cuffed together and are trying to get away from a bunch of multitude of bad guys which means they have to drive a car through the streets of Rome. Unfortunately, the cuff, they've been cuffed in a way that Tom Cruise can't comfortably drive a car. In a lot of instances, he has to flop into the passenger seat and Hayley Atwell has to drive the car. But she's panicking, she's scared, she's freaking out, she's not quite sure what's going on. So there's a lot of panic crashing and, and smashing into things and Tom Cruise is like, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Um, and then the car that they have to get into is not necessarily the car that Tom Cruise would like to drive. Uh, it's a very funny series of events, which someone in my theater thought was the funniest thing they'd ever seen. They were cackling and I got to agree. It was very, very funny, but I noticed it was like, it's working for me because those two are working so well together as a comedic duo. Um, as a result of Hayley Atwell being pushed to the front though, I do feel like Rebecca Ferguson's Ilsa, who has been sort of Tom Cruise's uh, romantic interest of sorts for the last couple of films, she does get sort of pushed to the side to focus on Hayley Atwell a lot. A lot of the team do in this instance, uh, but it's, it's very noticeable in terms of Rebecca Ferguson because she gets pushed out of the film in certain chunks and then has to come back. I'm used to Luther and Benji supporting whatever's going on. Ilsa, it feels a bit more forced. It's like, oh, we've got Hayley Atwell now, so we don't really know what to do with you specifically. But she does have some really good character moments in here, some good action stuff of her own. So when she is in the film, she's used effectively. So that's pretty good. Uh, if you've been watching the Mission Impossible franchise for a while, you will recognize returning characters. Henry Cizzoni is back as Kittredge who hasn't been seen since the first Mission Impossible in 1996, and he is just as confusingly slimy and scrupulous as ever. You don't quite know if he is an ally or an enemy to Ethan. I don't think anybody really does. There's a lot of people wanting to help each other, but also very clearly want to get that entity for their own either nefarious purposes or in their mind, the greater good purposes. But it means there's a lot of temporary alliances and then temporary stabbing in the backs. Uh, you've got a couple of IMF agents directly going after Ethan, the main one played by Shea, Shea Wiggum. Uh, I quite liked in that he is definitely portrayed as a bit of a bumbling fool. There is a very funny moment, which you'll have to watch the movie and see, which involves him going, Tom Cruise has to be around here somewhere. And you can see exactly where Tom Cruise is. And the way that is shown, very funny. So I thought that was a good, interesting, fugitive style point thrown in that we've never got in these films before. A lot of the time, Ethan and friends are on the run, but you never see the people who are actually hunting them. And whether they're competent or not is up to you. As I said, this is all about the stunts though, and you've seen it in the trailers. I will say that's a detriment to the film is that a lot of the cool stuff in this film you have seen in the trailers. You have seen the big stunt. That is uh, Tom Cruise's big thing. He always does one really big stunt. In this one, it's him on a motorbike jumping off a cliff to, to parachute onto a train somewhere. Um, and if you've seen any movie this year, you will have seen the trailer, you will have seen him doing it, which is a real shame. I would have liked if the trailers would have seen him about to do it and then cut. 
But that said, still looks incredible. And he's actually doing it. You have uninterrupted takes of him doing it, so you know he's doing it. You can see the G-force on his face when he's delivering his lines. He's actually free-falling next to a cliff. And as I said, when you're just coming off CGI Indiana Jones uh, and CGI Ant-Man, uh, you do have a real appreciation for going, this is real, this is happening. It's more satisfying to me uh, than I felt in some time, which is awesome. Uh, if you haven't seen the trailer, I would thank your lucky stars and try not to see it going into this film because, for instance, the, there's a big final set piece on a train. If you've seen any trailers, you know who's on the train, which means at some point in the film you have certain characters being told that only one of them is going to make it on the train and the other will die. And if you've been paying any sort of attention, you're like, oh, okay, that person's going to die. And that alleviates the tension of that point. But it's a minor nitpick, and if you've made it this far without seeing the trailer, I don't think it's going to be a problem for you. You can probably guess what's going to happen, but it's still impactful to see it unfold. At the end of the day, Dead Reckoning for me gets a solid 8 out of 10. It doesn't quite crack the top 5 for me this year, which I am a little disappointed about because the way Fallout was with me and Rogue Nation before that, I thought it would get a lot higher. But that's not because Dead Reckoning is an inferior film, it's just because there have been some solid films this year. The competition for that top 5 is strong. And things will tend to change for me on rewatches as well. But at the end of the day, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 lived up to my expectations, was a fun ride, was a real solid addition to the big action spectacle that is this franchise. All of my favorite characters got something to do. It was an engaging, unique plot that I haven't seen a thousand times before. And it was a Part 1 film that was exciting and left me ready for the second one, but not in a pull the rug out from under me, cut the black way where I feel like the story is incomplete. This part of the story is finished, uh, but the overall story is not. And I'm ready for part two when it comes out next year to wrap this all up. Maybe forever. Maybe it will be the final Mission Impossible film, but it will definitely probably most likely be the final Tom Cruise one. And that will be interesting. And I'm ready for that. Bring on next year. Let's do it. There we are. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed. Um, I won't be back until next week, but we will have two episodes back to back where we will be finally seeing which is better, Wonderful Barbie or Depressing Oppenheimer. Uh, Barbie's first. I'm going to an advanced screening for that. A girls' night out screening, if you will, but apparently Ken's are allowed to go, so don't judge. Uh, and then the very next day we'll be sitting down in a, in a fancy IMAX theater, or at least Australia's version of IMAX, uh, to see Oppenheimer discover how to destroy the world. I really don't know which one I'm going to like more. I don't think it really is a matter of which one I like more because they're two very different films. But I am interested to see how the world reacts to these films and how the box office reflects it. Um, I really don't know. Uh, I feel like Barbie will crush Oppenheimer, but I do feel like a lot of people are like, I'm going to see Oppenheimer first because that's a film. That's a film. And then I'll go drink some mimosas and watch Barbie. And that's fine too. I hope both of them are successful. And I hope both of them are good. But be sure to tune in next week to find out what I thought of it. Either one of them, because I'm sure that's very important to you all out there. Until then, I love and appreciate you as always. Go see Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. Solid film. Great time. And I will catch you all next week. I love and appreciate you as always. Adios muchachos. I'll catch you next time. 